live. Uh, we're going live. We're going live, live, live. We're back. We're back. We're how's it going, everybody? Welcome to the show. It's Bruce here with Traveling with Bruce. Welcome to the Saturday edition, two o'clock Eastern time. Where have you been? Where have you been? I've been gone for three days. I'm back. Ah, so glad to be back. I lost some hair. I went to Calgary and I lost a bunch of hair. I'm taking a look at this little this little cut here. You know this little style thing. You can see that there. You see that? I think that's the Kim Jong Il look there. You know you you kind of you got. I think they had to go a little higher, and then I could have just had the top only. Could have gone with the Kim Jong look, but I uh, you know I'm just not that stylish. I guess. Oh my goodness! It's May the twelfth. Welcome Saturday afternoon. Oh my goodness, I've been away for three whole days. Uh, although I did get a video in, I think on the day I was leaving, it was on uh, it was a Wednesday. I took off uh, for three days. Yeah, it was Wednesday morning. I I did that video about the uh, Oceania, uh, Oceania. Ocean, I don't know how do you pronounce that cruise line anyway. I I go Ocean Ocean Ia Oceania Oceania Oceaniana. Anyway, all about the Marina cruise ship <laughs> stuck in Trois Rivières. Quebec on the St. Lawrence Seaway because the St. Lawrence Seaway is running so high with the runoff from uh, from winter, the ship can't get under the uh, gigantic bridge, the Laviolette Bridge. That's a four-way highway across the St. Lawrence. <laughs> they can't get under that bridge to get down to Montreal, so they're stuck in Trois Rivières. And what a what an episode that was bringing in uh, what was that forty almost forty buses? I think they brought in on an emergency basis to take the 1,200 passengers stuck in Trois-Rivières to Montreal, 120 odd miles away, and their 2,000 pieces of luggage at the very least. Uh, and then in Montreal, they use the same buses to just turn around and pick up the 1,200 new passengers, <laughs> put them on the buses with their 2,000 plus pieces of uh, luggage, and bus them back to Trois-Rivières where the ship was waiting in the meantime, all kinds of trucks with the food, the booze, the toilet paper, the towels, the whatever provisions had to be brought on board um, were headed 120 miles up the highway to Trois River to the port to get to that ship. And they, of course, offloaded, you know, what they had to get rid of, bought fuel there, I guess, or got fuel there, and um, loaded that ship up while the passengers were being bussed down, brought uh, new passengers being brought back. What a story. Uh, unbelievable. The logistics of it and the dollars, the, the emergency dollars that were unaccounted for that had to now be spent by the cruise line to make this work. This is, uh, this is something serious, but that's the risk you take when you are trying to uh, uh, enter the St. Lawrence Seaway um, in the first two weeks of May uh, after a you know pretty heavy duty winter with all the storms you folks had in the U.S., uh, you know in Virginia, you know in uh, Pennsylvania, you know in New Jersey, New York, Maine, Massachusetts, Chicago, Kansas City knows, uh, Atlanta even knows how much uh, how many systems came through one after the other after the other all winter long, uh, relentlessly dumping how many feet of snow everywhere. I'm unbelievable that. Multiply that up by the St. Lawrence, and you get all those rivers from from the U.S. side and from the Quebec side and Ontario side, dropping all that runoff into Lake Ontario, Lake Erie, over the Niagara Falls, and through uh, the St. Lawrence Seaway and coming out. Yeah, is it any wonder that uh, the Seaway is so much higher than normal? Probably, I bet you it's 20 feet higher than normal. I mean, surely, surely massive amounts. And uh, ship couldn't go down there. So uh, it's going to be a while before that runoff fully finds its way into the basically the Atlantic. Uh, and then uh, things will be kind of back to normal, maybe. <laughs> and then ships can go back under the bridges. Normal. I'm sure smaller ships right now can go. But uh, that cruise ship with its tall uh, smokestack and all that equipment up there, there's no way that that sucker could have fit under there. Would have knocked the bridge out. Couldn't do that. What a deal that was. Anyway, I did that story on Wednesday before I left for Calgary. And uh, and uh, uh, I haven't been on the air since. Ooh, I've been watching the channel ever since. And I've been watching you guys, uh, uh, my comments coming in. And uh, uh, people, you know, been watching a bunch of my videos and stuff. And uh, uh, also, I'm just making note of my uh, subscriber count. I just remember to do this. 
Uh, since I was on the air last, when I was on the air on Tuesday night, trivia night, uh, to now, um, we've added 27 subscribers. So we're at 1,937 subscribers, 63 away from 2,000 subscribers for Traveling with Bruce. Yay, we're going to make it to 2,000 subscribers maybe this week. That's pretty good stuff. Awesome stuff indeed. Uh, today is month number nine. I started this channel August the 12th, uh, 2017. Today's May the 12th, 2018. Nine months since I started this channel, and I'm approaching 2,000 subscribers. Fantastic. Thanks to all of you and your uh, following. And a lot of you out there are telling friends and pals and emailing people and social media sharing me. And <laughs> that's fantastic. I had a great time in Calgary. Uh, saw my daughter and. Um, and a boyfriend and uh and their pussy cats and uh got some business done and uh talked to people about my channel uh people uh, have heard about it or uh, they go don't you have a don't you have a channel yeah well what's it about and i'll tell them about my channel and they just they just draw they can't believe it they says oh my god it's only been nine months and you've done all this oh my goodness then i tell them about my store they can't believe i have a store on the internet uh, selling uh traveling with bruce uh, merchandise they, they're just going, well, that, that's like you. Yeah, you're kind of entrepreneurial like that. That's pretty cool. And uh, I tell them about my viewers and my live streams. I just can't believe I'm on the air all this time. They can't believe I talk to, uh, to, uh, uh, to a camera on my computer like this uh, six days a week, uh, eight, times, eight times a week, six days a week, eight times a week. They can't believe it, uh, but they, can, they get it. They, they say, oh, I can, I can see that. Yeah, I, I, can, see, I can see that working because, yeah, because you're, you're an enjoyable church person to hang around with. I can see what's going on. So it was nice, nice compliments. Um, so great. I'm very happy about that. Still unmonetized uh, through uh, the gloriousness of YouTube, unfortunately for me. Uh, so no commercial revenue coming in from the YouTube side of things. Um, read some more crap about YouTube the other day. I read something about, uh, what was it, C Cisco Systems? Uh, the big computer or software outfit uh, or computer too. Um, Cisco said something about, uh, uh, so what's the story? It was a it was a story about how Cisco and other advertisers found out that um, some analytical studies were done on advertising on YouTube, and uh, that it Cisco and other advertisers found that their commercials were being run um, on on uh, really nasty videos like uh, like you know white supremacy stuff and Nazi stuff and uh, just 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 out of the millions and millions and millions and millions of videos that are uploaded all the time, um, these ads, you know, they just get scattered out there. And for whatever reason, I don't understand it myself, why YouTube ends up with some of these commercials on some of these uh, videos. I, I don't get it. I don't know how their analytics uh, get fuddled up, but they do. And so these, uh, these ads, some of these ads, very few, I'm sure, but a few uh, got in front of some of these nasty video deals and uh cisco is uh, is seriously thinking of pulling their advertising and uh youtube is struggling with this this um, effort to convince advertisers that you know uh, uh out of the millions and tens of millions of videos going up all the time that the odds of any one of your commercials ever being involved with this are so minuscule to me um i look at it from two sides i get the pr side you don't want your brand to in any way be associated with something you know untoward uh but i look at it on the other point of view and i go oh okay let's say there are 50 people watching that video and 50 people saw your ad out of the what 50 million customers you've got 50 people may have seen a five second piece of your ad in front of a thing is this going to ruin your company probably not but if a columnist a columnist <laughs> or a journalist writes about it uh, to the world and says Cisco is obviously supporting white supremacy by advertising in front of their videos. Well, then that doesn't look good, does it? So that's where the damage comes from. That's the damage. The the practical damage is negligent, but it's a pain in the rear end. And for YouTube, it's a big problem because for YouTube, it, it puts the the the, uh, the uh, reputation on their shoulders that they're the ones screwing it up. They are. They are screwing that up, and I kind of ask myself, why can't you guys uh, monetize my channel and uh, have ads running, you know, on this content, 
well, why, while this stuff is still being monetized. I don't even know why they're monetized at all. I don't know how YouTube hasn't eliminated these channels from, ex from monetization existence. They want to broadcast on YouTube to their, you know, diehard followers. Go ahead. But there won't be any ads on it. Just demonetize the darn thing completely. And their problem solved. Uh, monetize moi. Uh, and I think you can be pretty safe because <laughs> I, I think we're PG rated here. But uh, I, I, I don't know how YouTube works uh, in that area, in that field. I'm just a guy talking to his peeps about cruise ships, going on cruise ship vacations, uh, playing trivia games from time to time, having a good time, kibitzing back and forth with my people, um, trying to grow my channel as best I can, and I can't understand the other side of it. Uh, hi, Cisco. Uh, I hope you're adver you know consider advertising on me. Uh, I think you'd be okay. I think you'd be surprised. I'm pleased with the folks that watch my show. Um, and Dairy Queen and Ford and uh, Cadillac and Tiffany Jewelers and Pond's Hand Cream and Caffeine Free Diet Coke. Uh, hi, guys. Uh, how you doing? This is good stuff. Uh, you know, this is where you want to advertise. Uh, I think we're the good guys, but um, I can't make them do it. So I starve in the meantime and not get paid by YouTube on advertising uh until they get their act together and this could be till the end of june another six weeks seven weeks practically so i got you know maybe that much longer to go which would then make it all of march april may uh june four months and ten days of no monetization revenue from our friends at youtube uh i'm on my own and uh that brings me to you folks thank you again for all your support uh, for helping me with my store, picking up merchandise from time to time, helping me with Patreon contributions, uh, sponsoring me through that, uh, which is a sort of a monthly contribution. Appreciate those. Uh, thank you for super chats when I'm on the air. Uh, although I do prefer, and I have been receiving, PayPal contributions from you guys, which is the best, le primo way to go for me. 93% of the proceeds comes to my to my use. Instantly, it's available to us, and I can pay bills right away. I don't have to wait up to six weeks to get any dough from YouTube. So thank you for all the support every way it's coming, whether you're a subscriber or just a casual viewer or a full-time viewer. I, I love it, and I thank all of you. So that's that. Now, um, I want to say hi to my peeps. If you've never been here before, uh, if you're one of these new people that I bumped into in Calgary and you're watching this for the first time, <laughs> welcome. Uh, if you've been brought here by a friend who said, you, you should watch this guy, he, he's okay, uh, well, well, welcome as well. Um, you can subscribe to my channel. There's a button here. There's a button here. If you click this button, it doesn't matter which one you click, but beside this button, I think it's this one, there's a little bell icon. You click on that, you'll get notified every time I do a video, every time I go live, every time there's an announcement on my channel. You'll get like an email saying, oh, Bruce is uh, uploading a, a YouTube video right now. You can catch it. Uh, it's free to you, uh, convenient uh, if, you, if you're working and you're a busy person and you wonder, oh, look at I got an email from uh, Bruce. He just posted a video about two hours ago. Fantastic. I'll check it out. Welcome to the channel as a new subscriber. We're going for 2,000 subs. Hopefully this next week we'll make it, and uh, that'll be another milestone set on this channel. Uh, if you're watching me, type in. Tell me, where are you watching me from? What's your? Where are you? Tell me, what's your high temperature going to be today? I'm in Creston, British Columbia, here in Canada, just about three miles north of the U.S. border. It's a beautiful, clear, sunny, gorgeous day here today. We're going to be in the mid-70s today. We're going to be in the mid-80s tomorrow and Monday already. Uh, summer is definitely on the way. It's absolutely fantastic here. Uh, we're loving it, and uh, I'm, sh shortly, I'm shortly going to have to turn the air conditioning on in the house because I've got floor-to-ceiling windows here in my living room that just give me this glorious view. But also, <laughs> they, uh, it acts as a bit of a radiator, and the heat comes in. Now, mind you, I do have a bit of an overhang, and there isn't direct sunshine coming into the house, but uh, it warms up pretty good. So we're looking forward to that. I prefer the heat over no heat, so uh, that's fantastic. And let's see who's here. I'm going to say hi to my peeps. I haven't talked to them for three days and find out what's going on. If any of you out there have any questions about going on a cruise ship, taking a cruise ship vacation, finding a deal. Uh, figuring out uh, what's it like on a cruise ship. What am I allowed to bring with me on a cruise? How to save money on a cruise? Any question about a port you're going to visit? 
uh, talk to me about that. Today's topic that I've got going is um, why crews of cruise ships, the crews themselves, why they love the European cruise season, which is now beginning. Why, why is it they love the European cruise season? I'll tell you in a few minutes. Uh, in the meantime, let's say hi to everybody. Peter Heckema was the first sighting in to say hi to me today. He says, uh, hi, Bruce. Hi, hope you enjoyed your mini vacation. I really missed your shows. 91 degrees in uh, Tarpon Springs, Florida today. It has been at least 90 for the last several days. Uh, really enjoying the hot weather. I, I'm with you there, Peter. That's fantastic. Welcome back, sir. It's great to have you. Thank you for your contribution a couple days ago to my PayPal channel, to my PayPal account. And also, you made another order. Uh, yeah, I think you ordered some coffee mugs from my channel. So that's great. Let me know how they turn out when you get them. Debbie Manuel is here, one of my loyal followers. Uh, hi, Bruce, and hope the trip was wonderful. Uh, says there'll be a high of 86 here today and plenty of sun in Chico, Northern California. She's saying hi to Peter as well. Paul Wilgus is here. Hi, Bruce and all. 84 and humid and sunny here in Virginia. Paul, welcome. Debbie, welcome. Uh, Silo Steve is here. Hey, all 74 for the high, 49 for the low in Seattle. Sunny, 168 days to the bliss and glory of the Haven Club. Fantastic. That's going to be a nice cruise. Tom Eaton, 92 in Jacksonville, Florida. Giving a shout out from the Carnival Relation with a rum and coke in hand, sailing in two hours on board. Tommy, that's great. It's your first cruise. I'm pretty sure it's your first cruise. Uh, let us know how it goes. I'm sure it's going okay already. If you got a rum and coke in hand, you're already on the ship. I think putting one and one together is coming up with a good score here. This is great stuff. Silo Steve sounds fun. Tommy, my cruise drink of choice is the painkiller. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> we all have our version of the painkiller. Oh, that's good stuff, Silo. Uh, Iskew Park. Hi, Bruce. It's Iskew in Thunder Bay, Ontario. It's plus nine Celsius, sunny and light breeze. How's everyone doing? We're doing great, buddy. Welcome back to the show from Thunder Bay. Debbie is asking how exciting to, oh, saying how exciting Tommy's so jealous because uh, he's on the cruise and we're not. Uh, Steamy Bean, uh, hearing uh, hearing about a cruise, the St. Lawrence is as exciting about a trivia session on Elvis movies. <laughs> Whoopee, he's going. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome, buddy. 24 degrees Celsius here in Sandy Bay, Saskatchewan. That is a melt fest up there. That is awesome, Steamer. Uh, Randy Lucas is also here. Hey, Bruce and all. Michelle and I are, are in the big-ass RV. We left Las Vegas this morning for an overnight in, you guessed it, Bakersfield. We're going to go and do an overnight in Bakersfield tonight in California in our big-ass RV. Awesome stuff. I had a picture taken with, with me uh, just the other day in my my big SRV. I hope you folks saw it. I put it on YouTube. I put it on, sorry, I put it on Facebook. I put it on Instagram. I do, I Twittered it. Uh, hopefully you've seen it. Um, anyway, <laughs> Kathy Butler, woohoo, made it. Hey, Kathy, how you doing? Nina Frank, hi, Bruce and all. Been a beautiful sunny day in Sweden today. How about uh, now? About 15 degrees uh, Celsius at eight in the evening. Still pretty nice. That's close to 60 degrees in the evening. Nice going, Nina. That's fantastic weather. Seakeeper is here. Hi, Bruce and all. Cloudy, breezy, and 81 Fahrenheit in the shade. Thumbs up. That is good stuff. Sea Keeper, welcome, pal. The steamy bean. Are you planning on raffling off that plant behind you? Uh, no, that's my wife's plant. She's been trying to kill it for years. Uh, apparently, you just give it water. It lives forever. I don't get it. Um, <laughs> Chad Williams. Hi, Bruce. Abbotsford, sunny. Hi, 26. Chad Williams, how you doing? If you're new, welcome to the channel. If you're uh, a regular, a repeat, repeat offender, welcome back. Uh, great to have you. 26 Celsius. Nothing wrong with that. That's pretty darn good weather. We'll take that all the way to the bank. Very, very nice. Um, I was going to show you guys, uh, see if I can make this pop up. Here we go. Yeah, here we go. Check it out. Look at that big ass RV that I'm standing beside there. How about that, huh? Pretty good stuff, baby. Now, that's a big ass RV. I got to tell you. Oh, my goodness. I had a lot of reactions from people who saw that on my Facebook post. And on my Twitter and on Instagram, I got all kinds of thumbs ups. And oh my, there it is. They see it themselves, the big ass RV. Now, you know, $5 worth of gas at that thing. It's a diesel pusher, yeah. But five bucks doesn't take it very far. Look how big that thing is. It's huge. <laughs> now, let's see what we got. I got a couple of trivia questions for you guys today, which I've set up. And we'll put you through your paces there in a little bit. Uh, but the, the topic of the day that I came up with today, just to kind of uh, throw in a little cruise news here, was why do you why do crews of cruise ships like the shift from the Caribbean 
over to the European uh, cruising season. What, what, what's the big deal about that? And uh, there's several reasons for this because um, uh, generally speaking, um, well, there's actually five reasons I'll have to uh, I'll go into them with you. The first one is uh, no more surprise inspections from the U.S. Uh, public health authorities. Uh, uh, now, cruise ships run a pretty tight operation with regard to how clean they try to keep their vessels. Uh, we don't see the behind the scenes stuff very much because we, you know, we're all excited on embarkation day. We got our bags to check in. We got to go to the counter and check in there. We got to make sure we have our paperwork with us, our passports. And then we're waiting to get called to get on the ship. And all we want to do is, is find our room and, uh, you know, change to just get into, you know, ship clothes, ship wear, you know, relax and maybe head for the buffet or the restaurant or the spa area or swimming pool or even the bar or like Tommy here has already got his rum and coke going. You know, we know what we want to do. But in the meantime, while all that's going on, there are 2,000 people, you know, probably 400 shore workers and 1,600 crew frantically getting the ship ready for us because they just finished getting rid of the last batch of travelers. And if you're on something like, uh, you know, the Symphony of the Seas, you just got off, got 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 rid of 6,000 plus passengers. And you're getting ready to bring 6,000 plus passengers on and the ship's got to be completely clean from top to bottom. Every room's got to be redone, all the bedding off, all the towels, everything into the laundry down below. And here we go. Um, I don't know the logistics and I'd love to see it sometime. I'd love to, I'd love to get a private tour or something like this. And I'd love to bring it to you. And someday maybe I can pull this off where I, I'd love to be in say Fort Lauderdale and uh, get a behind the scenes tour from a from a Royal Caribbean people on on their behind the scenes activities on just how they handle the logistics of a turnover a turnaround. I've seen some of these shows on cable. I know we all have uh, where you see um, snippets of of what's going on, but you don't see the you don't see much of it. You see ten seconds, ten seconds here, ten seconds there, because you got all these different departments. You got the captain and his crew, and the officers. You've got the hotel manager. You've got the uh, the restaurant managers. You, got the luggage guys you got the loaders down below you, you know so how much time can you give a 30 minute show to a turnaround of a cruise ship you, you can't uh but i would love to see just something like the logistics of the laundry like what do you do with six thousand people that you know you had you have uh what six thousand pillow covers you got to take off and put on fresh then you got uh, the sheets you got the towels on all these suites uh when they come into port at the end of a week's long cruise uh do they just do they just pile them all into big you know rolling type buckets you know whatever those things bins and just get them off the ship and bring in freshly made laundry that's been done on shore is it just cheaper to do it on shore and more efficient and they just have you know bring them on and, and that's the next week's supply or are they washing them all the time are they are they doing the laundry for all seven days uh, or are they just stacking the dirty laundry up and only doing some laundry? Because they've got laundry to do in the restaurants as well, the tablecloths and the napkins and then the towels on the decks. I, I, I don't know. I, something tells me they do it all on the ship and very little on shore. Um, and perhaps every cruise or every second cruise or every fifth cruise, tenth cruise, they'll bring on, you know, uh, a thousand new towels because uh, a thousand old towels are worn. They have holes in them, got lost, uh, stolen. People took them and they got to, you know, keep replenishing the towel supply, uh, this kind of thing. I don't know. I'd be curious about all of that. Anyway, uh, the, the surprise inspection part of this for the crew is a pain because uh, you come into a U.S. port, you never know if your ship has been targeted for a, for a surprise inspection. And that means a head to toe thing. And that's hours of time out of your schedule for turning over the ship, getting ready for the next cruise. Because in the meantime, while all these inspectors are nosing around everywhere, Everybody has to be accountable for, you know, their space. And the managers are panicked. Uh, the manager's managers are panicked. The captain is, you know, calmly panicked. And the, the cruise line is, you know, waiting for the green light to be released by these inspectors. And could be two of them, could be 20 of them. I don't know. Before they can get on with the business of taking care of their passengers. So they're trying to do a lot of things at the same time. And I guess some of these crew people, they find this to be a real pain in the rear end uh, uh, they understand why, but they would rather that it would just be, a, let's just have scheduled uh, appointments for this stuff. And we'll just, you know, the ship will be ship shape. We pride ourselves in being ship shape. And if we've got a whole bunch of sick passengers every cruise, you know, something's up. Uh, if they're not getting sick every cruise, you know, something's not up. But 
rules are rules and compliance is compliance, and the U.S. has its way of doing its thing. And uh, uh, in Europe, I guess it is not as panicky and restrictive and and and, and uh, authoritative. Um, it it just seems to be more. Um, I don't know what the word is. More regulated. More uh, more regular. More. Um, organized for everybody in in concern i don't know the word but i guess uh, crews are just happier being in uh, the mediterranean in europe than in the u.s uh handling the uh, the u.s clientele for uh alaska for uh, mexican cruises and caribbean cruises don't know just what i what i read and i'm just passing it on the second point is uh in europe they have more what they call overnights and what they mean by that is the ship will come in and will spend two nights in Barcelona or two nights in Mallorca or two nights in Rome or two nights in Venice, two nights in Athens. And this gives the, the chance for some of the crew members to get off the ship. <laughs> and this is a big deal for crew morale. And I'm not talking about the officers of these crews. They have way more rights and freedom than than. The other, I'm talking about some of the grunts who are really stuck down below. They're way down there, and when they have a an overnighter in uh, Athens, they get off the ship for uh, six hours, eight hours. They get a break, and uh, this is a true break. I mean, it's a real break rather than just being an employee lounge or playing a video game in your room or or in or, you know doing email to home. You get on shore, and uh, you can just you know, buy a cheap uh, ice cream cone from a street vendor, uh, walk around, take some photos yourself, could be a tourist for a while. Um, this is a huge break. And in Europe, it provides plenty of that, quite a bit of that on these seven day, 10 day, 12 day Mediterranean type cruises. So that's a biggie for these guys, a real biggie. Whereas in the Caribbean, you have these seven day schedules. The cruise ship is going to a private island uh, on Coco, you know, Coco Cay. What's to see? <laughs> the cruise member, the cruise member coming off the ship for six hours, they they can't fraternize with the with the staff, with the passengers, so they can't go. They're they're stuck on the ship, and if it stops in uh, uh, in say St. Thomas, every week St. Thomas again and again. Well, you know, see it once, you've seen it. Uh, see it maybe once a month. Maybe you might go off the ship. It, this is the repetitiveness of it. it. It just it just bores them to death. And I get it. Uh, the passengers to them are the same because it's the same kind of folks every cruise, and it's mundane. And uh, the stops are the same. And if it's bad weather, we don't even get off the ship, and now you're stuck. And if it was your day to get off at St. Thomas for six hours and we can't get there because of the weather, you're stuck on that ship and you've lost your shore, your shore day because the next stop – Somebody else's turn, and they get to go. You, yours came and went. Sorry, tough luck. In Europe, uh, with with all the cruises uh, uh, um, and the variety of, of European ports, you might have a ten day cruise with nine stops. Well, with nine stops, uh, the whole crew gets a turnaround, maybe two turnarounds of opportunities to get off the ship for a six hour, four hour, eight hour time frame. Uh, there's a lot of that. So I can see where this uh, really would work for people. It would be a, a big, big morale booster. Uh, more diverse itineraries. Uh, yes, again, if you've got a 12-day Mediterranean cruise, you may have 11 stops. And the next week, you've got a 10-day itinerary with eight stops and four of them might be different. Because in the Mediterranean, you can have dozens of areas to go to, as we all know, about where can you stop in the Mediterranean uh, on a Mediterranean cruise. It's not just Barcelona and uh, and uh, Genoa and Rome and Naples. It is much more than that. You've got the uh, Eastern Mediterranean, the Western Mediterranean. Uh, you've got some African stops. You've got some stops up along France and, and Portugal and, and so on. So there's a huge variety. Uh, this, also, if this cruise happens to uh, do a couple of ports, uh, you say in Northern Europe, you've got all of Britain, uh, you've got Ireland, you've got Norway, Amsterdam, you've got the Netherlands, Denmark, uh, German ports. It's a huge, a huge deal for these crew members to get a change in the thing. Uh, what else are I going to mention? The food, the food, the food. Uh, these folks also, uh, you know, there's some of them who are, you know, very uh, picky eaters and they only want to eat what they cook at home. So if you're Filipinos, 
The Filipinos will want the Filipino food. They have their own chef on board. They make the food their way. Great. Uh, but there are some from the Philippines and, and from other countries who would like a little more variety. And they've traveled the world a little bit. And uh, they would love some Italian, but they would like some authentic or they would love some authentic Spanish food, or they love some authentic uh, France, or some authentic from uh, food from, say, Istanbul and Turkey. They get their short excursions, and they can get street food, uh, which isn't from from the ship, and it's completely different. And uh, they, they have to pay for it, but they get that, and that they look forward to that, like we look forward to something unique when we go on a cruise or on a European holiday itself. So I, I get that. And then the last one, and I don't want to offend anyone. <laughs> <laughs> but the expression is no more iced tea. And what that means is, what, and that's a code word, ah, they're not surrounded by just Americans anymore. And I apologize to American viewers because they're putting me in the same boat because uh, I'm from Canada. They just love the fact that when they're in Europe, they are looking at 3,000 passengers getting a ship or 5,000 or 6,000, whatever the number is of the ship. Uh, you're talking about uh, maybe 80 countries of uh, passengers uh, coming on board. So the, yeah, there are Canadians, there are Americans, there are Mexicans, there you know, yeah. But there are Brits and Swedes and Norwegians and Germans and French and Italian and Tunisians and uh, Pakistani and uh, you name it. I mean, it's a wide variety of people on board in the restaurants, in the hallway, on the the deck, at the shows, and so they feel so much more global. Uh, and these folks are not from North America, the workers, generally speaking. They're not generally North American. They are the world. Uh, so the world is serving us, and now the world is serving the world uh, because European cruising attracts um, visitors from around the planet. And, of course, the European Union itself, the, the, the area of Europe you have within a 500-mile, you know, 1,000-mile 1, radius of, say, um, Genoa, or Barcelona, or more Genoa, for perhaps uh, perhaps Venice, 500 miles around Venice, you got 40 countries, 45. How many how many cultures have you got? It's just, just it's unbelievable. So the the so-called iced tea crowd, the iced tea drinkers, are North Americans, <laughs> and it's uh, you know what do you want to drink in a, in the Caribbean cruise? You you, you ask the a table of four in the buffet, what would you like to have? And since you don't get free pop and you don't get free alcohol, what's free? Uh, we like iced tea. <laughs> and they, yeah, it's iced tea, iced tea, iced tea, iced, all the time, iced tea. That's a definition of North American drinkers, um, uh, casual drinkers. Now, of course, the kids drink milk. I love my diet, caffeine free. We all have our taste, but a whole lot of iced tea is consumed on Caribbean cruises. Not so much in the European cruises, not as much on the, on the Mediterranean cruises and Northern uh, Europe cruises. And so I just mentioned that as a, uh, it's code <laughs> in the world of, these employees and these employees they work hard as we know uh we we as if you're a regular cruiser like i am you folks all know how hard these guys work for us so we can enjoy the pleasures of a cruise ship uh so much work is take takes place below deck we never see it uh, we only appreciate it because we had the buffet is always full of food the towels are always done the bedding is always ready uh, the carpets are always clean. Um, the windows are always being washed. Uh, everything is just constantly being looked after. We don't even think about it. And that's the point. That's what the cruise ships are doing for us. They don't want us to think about all the work that's being done on our behalf. They just want us to have a good time. And the whole point of going on a cruise is to get away from the monotony of the home life and the office and the relatives and co-workers and what have you uh, and escape for a while. And they make it possible, but it's made possible by this hard labor from folks we don't know and we generally won't see and get to meet. And these are the folks that I'm talking about here who are looking forward to the change in season. Now in the fall, of course, it turns around and they're all coming back. They don't mind coming back to the Caribbean because now they know Europe is going to be cold, miserable, <laughs> rainy, windy. Let's head to the Caribbean for some nice warm weather. And their relatives back home are saying, you're so lucky to work on a cruise ship. You get to hang out in the Caribbean for the whole winter. <laughs> they go, yeah, but it's my 15th year. <laughs> and uh, I've done Europe. I've done Europe and I've done the Caribbean for 15 seasons in a row. To me, it's just a job. Uh, but, yeah, I understand that in the wintertime I'm in warm weather. But I'm down below. Uh, I don't get to sit on the lounger upstairs and sunbathe. 
Uh, I'm not paid. I'm not paid to be on holidays. I'm paid to work. So when I do get a day off, yep, I'll I'll, I'll go out to San San Juan or I'll go get out for a day on uh, Cozumel or whatever. But I, I still can't go to a resort hotel and hang out by the pool. I, I I can't do that. I only get three or four hours of of you know walk around time and a little bit of uh, you know sightseeing time perhaps. But uh, hey. It is what it is, and that is the world in which we live, and that's how the cruise business works. Uh, anyway, let's see who's saying what and what's going on before we play some uh, we play some trivia here. Uh, Thomas Henry, uh, yeah, hi everybody, Bruce is back. Woo hoo! Ninety-one sunny in Richmond today. I'm grocery shopping. He says at Lytle and Publix via Bluetooth headphones, listening to Bruce. Thomas, how you doing, buddy? Did you? He said, did you see the pics on Facebook? Of the stars, a refit, a pool deck is really stripped. Oh, interesting. Uh, Jim Thomas, hey, 89, here today in Anderson, California. Uh, Jim, welcome, buddy. Uh, interesting Thomas uh, comments there. Uh, Maurice uh, Eman is here. Hi, Bruce. Hi, Maurice. How you doing? Uh, Sylvia's here. Hey, Bruce and everyone. It's 89 degrees in Greensboro, but feels like 98. Hot as the blazes here. Graduation weekend in Greensboro. We'll listen later. Off to the graduation party. We'll see you later, Sylvia. Maurice, did you see Norwegian Bliss? I did. I've seen. Uh, I've seen a lot of video on it. A uh, seakeeper. It, it, it is my understanding that all laundry is done on board, twenty four hours a day, every day. They can't possibly let laundry pile up. The space is at a premium down there. I. I think you're right, seakeeper. Uh, I agree with that. Jim Thomas sent me five dollars on super chat. There's the green bar. Thank you, Jim, again for another contribution. Uh, you're so nice to me. Uh, Maurice uh, is saying, are the plugs on MSC Seaside in the rooms European or American? Uh, they're both. They're both. They handle North American and European. So you got both sides, uh, Maurice. Maurice, uh, the outlets, uh, uh, Sylvia, I didn't uh, forget your thumbs up. Uh, thanks, Sylvia. Terrence, uh, um, uh, Maurice on MSC there usually have both. Uh, steaming bean, uh, 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 is it curious? What, are, what is the rate of the Filipino workers? How many are there? There's a sizable number depending on the cruise line. I know on uh, Hall of America, it's a sizable number. Uh, some of the cruise lines have, um, you know, quite a large number of Filipinos or Indian workers uh, from India. Um, some have Indonesians um, in, in numbers. I mean, in serious numbers. Others have to have a mix. Um, but uh, I know that in the uh, in the case of uh, Hall of America and also on Princess, because I had a friend of mine who was a dancer on Princess. He would tell me that below deck, um, the, 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 the largest groups would have their own chefs for their own food and the cruise lines would uh, would hire staff to look after the staff so you know not only are there staff to look after us there's staff to look after the staff and uh, for the filipinos they have their own cooks uh producing exactly the, the dishes that they are used to having uh, back home it makes them sign up for contract after contract after contract uh because these folks don't want to eat KFC like <laughs> or that kind of food. That's not their shtick. Um, let's see here. Uh, the steamy bean also cruise workers refer to the customers as pylons. <laughs> Peter Hackett about Maurice. The electrical plugs are both American and European. Uh, Maurice, uh, are the cruise ships doing anything for the volcano that blew up in Hawaii? Um, I know that the, uh, the story came out a few days ago, maybe last week, about Norwegian was saying that their Pride of America ship that uh, there's their that's their full time uh, it will avoid dangerous areas obviously um, the good news about the volcano so far is it hasn't spewed uh, lava and ash into the air where it affects uh, sea operations but uh, the cruise lines always monitor uh, just like the airlines um, volcanic ash and debris going into the atmosphere and the wind direction uh, so that they avoid getting anywhere near uh, this uh, this material, poisonous gases, uh, pumice, uh, you name it. I mean, there's, cruise ships are not in the habit of uh, bringing passengers close in to volcanoes for a peak. Uh, that's not their shtick. Uh, they avoid these areas and will uh, will stay in ports and islands in the, in the Hawaii uh, far away from the island, from that particular island. The Hawaiian Islands, I believe, from the north to the south, we're talking 1,500 miles of territory. And so the the ships have plenty of places to head for to uh, in no way inconvenience any passengers or the sh safety of the ship to be anywhere near the, this particular volcano. <clears throat> so I did uh, 
I have noticed that the other day. Stimmy Bean, have you read the book Cruise Ship Confidential? No, I have not. Uh, uh, is that the one, uh, I'm just going to ask you, Steamer, is that the one written by a former cruise member? Uh, that uh, he's, The book's available on uh, on Amazon. I'm just curious. Diane Sanders is here checking in. Better late than ever. Hi, Diane. How you doing? Welcome to the show. Uh, I'm just getting ready to start trivia. Uh, Silo is here. The Philippines has a great training center. Most of those people are the main breadwinner for their family. They are. Um, uh, it is not uncommon for, for dad to work on the uh, cruise line. Uh, Mom and dad may have met working on the cruise ship years ago, uh, got married. Uh, and then after a few years, mom would stay home and have the kids while dad continued working in the cruise contract. And then as the children grew up, the children started joining dad on the cruise lines as well. And uh, generational. And it would just keep going. Uh, not surprising. Uh, a lot of the uh, managers of the restaurants, managers of the bars, uh, the hotel management, uh, like right up to high levels, are literally Filipino and have been with the cruise line since their 20s, late teens, 20s, all the way through. Now they're in their 40s and they've taken training courses and you know years of experience. And the cruise lines have graduated them up to be managers in charge of hundreds of employees each. Uh, and they report right to the top, right to the captain um, across the entire cruise line. Uh, I know that Norwegian uh, definitely has a high number of, of Filipinos working and other nationalities, and they graduate from within. They, they take their best and hang on to them and move them up the ranks. If they prove themselves as management material, the cruise lines work with them to get them up there. Yeah, very good career. Um, uh, he's saying it was indeed, Simi Bean saying that book was indeed available on Amazon. Uh, that is where the word a pylon comes from. <laughs> Very good, Steve. Jim Thomas, uh, so they uh, avoid volcanoes but will expose their customers uh, to their construction on their ships. Yes, uh, yeah, that's right. Uh, they, uh, Norwegian will, uh, will, avoid, uh, will avoid the uh, dust and contamination and dangerous, uh, uh, noxious, uh, toxic fumes of a volcano. But when it comes to the Norwegian Sun cruise ship uh, going into dry dock in Victoria uh, for four cruises in a row, they put 8,000 passengers at risk and 1,000 crew to all these chemicals that were being used on the decks of the ship while they relined the entire decks. And the photos that uh, we saw where the folks are on the deck of the ship and they're holding the rum and coke. And uh, after five minutes, the top layer, the top of the rum and croak is, is covered in uh, dust, construction dust from the uh, decks over here being sanded off and all this toxicity coming in there and the just clouds of this stuff. Just terrible. Just a terrible move on the part of Norwegian uh, when they pulled that terrible stunt. Very unfortunate, but they did it. And uh, they've only offered a credit, a cruise credit to one of the cruises for full cruise credit and the cruise before that only half, the cruises before that, nada, and uh, still not reacting. It's uh, unbelievable. But that's uh, what Norwegian did with the sun. And uh, what can I say? I, I, I don't agree with it. All right, are you ready for some trivia? Are you, are you ready for this? I got three uh, questions for you guys today on trivia today. Uh, let's see what, uh, what we can do with you guys on this one. <clears throat> Uh, the first one, uh, I'm going to go with the medium size question. This one has um, 11 answers uh, to it, and uh, it's countries that I'm looking for. And I want you to tell me, if you can, uh, can you tell me uh, all the countries that you can find at Costco? Since I was at Costco yesterday, by the way, I had the chicken wings yesterday. I didn't have a dog or a chicken bake because you can't get a chicken bake in Canada. But I did get the chicken wings because they don't have those in the United States. You can't get the chicken wings in the USA. We also had the French fries. You can't get French fries in the United States either. Uh, I had that. But anyway, tell me what uh, what countries you can find a Costco in. Uh, you should know two of them right off the get-go because uh, if you're watching this show, uh, of course, Canada, USA. There's Betsy, Debbie, Steaming Bean, Paul, Will Paul Wilkins is coming in there. So Betsy's got Canada. Uh, they've got 97, Canada. Considering Canada is the size of California in population, 97 locations, pretty big. The United States, of course, is number one, 512 locations. But the United States has 10 times the population that Canada has. And we're, we being one-tenth your population, we've got 20% of the equal number of Costco's. 
we got double the number of Costco's per capita in Canada than you guys have. That's how much we're addicted to Costco. Uh, my friend here, uh, so at Betsy, Debbie, and the Steaming Bean came in there with that. Paul Wilgus came in with the United Kingdom. And the UK has 28 stores. Yep, absolutely, Paul. You nailed it. And the Steaming Bean is thinking about uh, Mexico. Uh, Mexico doesn't have a Costco. I'm sorry, it does. Sorry, Steaming Bean, I, I don't want to pick on you, but you're right. <laughs> 37 uh, Costco's, third, third highest. UK is fourth highest. Uh, so we have USA with 512, Canada with 97, Mexico 37, and then UK with 28. So those are the first four, and the Steaming Bean got Mexico correct. Uh, Steaming Bean is also asking about Australia, and uh, Australia has nine locations so far uh, going. Very good on that one. And the Steaming Bean is going with NZ, MZ. I'm wondering if he's thinking New Zealand. He is thinking New Zealand. He uh, corrected himself. Not yet. No, New Zealand has does not have a Costco yet. Diane Sanders, she's wondering about China. Uh, China, not yet. Uh, Costco has not moved into China yet. Uh, wondering if it's only a matter of time. Uh, Betsy Lane, United Kingdom, uh, which we've got. A steaming Bean is thinking about uh, Germany. And uh, Germany at this point does not have a Costco. Uh, Jim Thomas uh, went with the USA, which we've got. Thomas Henry, have you ever done a behind-the-scenes tour the laundry is impressive. Big machines to pull the sheets, steamers for the uniforms. Yeah, it, it would be really cool. I haven't done a behind the scenes. I'd like to. Uh, it would be pretty cool. Diane Sanders is thinking Germany. We we checked that, not yet. Seakeeper is thinking about Japan. Uh, yeah, there are 26 Costco's in Japan, the fifth most uh, uh, in in uh, the Costco family. K Sib is wondering about. Ireland, uh, yikes, yikes, yikes. No, Ireland, not yet, although UK so far, wondering maybe that's in the future. Steaming Bean, thinking about Brazil, uh, no. Uh, thinking then about uh, Japan, we just just got Japan. Uh, then Steaming Bean is wondering about Argentina. Uh, Argentina is not on the uh, Costco list, no. Uh, Diane Sanders, France, yep, they have won. Uh, they've started with their first one. I'm sure they're expanding from there. Steam and Bean, the Netherlands. No, not the Netherlands, not yet. Betsy Lane, Iceland. And guess what? Yeah, there is a location in Iceland. One so far. Uh, K Sib also went with Iceland. Jim Thomas went with Australia, and there are nine there. Uh, Diane Sanders, Spain. What about Spain? There are two in Spain. Uh, we're down to two left, two countries left to go. Uh, Jim Thomas, South Korea, that's one of the two right there. 13 in South Korea. Yeah, that's picking up steam there. Steam and beans, Spain, we did get two there. Uh, the Vatican, <laughs> no, steam and beans. Paul Wilgus is thinking Norway. No, we have one country left. It's not Norway. Diane Sanders, Russia, not yet, not in Russia yet. There's one country left to go. I'll tell you who you got. You got the USA, Canada, Mexico, UK, Japan. Those are the first five. I'm looking for number six. We've got South Korea, Australia, Spain, France, and Iceland as the remaining uh, the remaining five. And I'm looking now for the last one. I see Norway, Russia, Italy, Taiwan. Here we are, Betsy Lane. You got it, Taiwan. 13 locations uh, in Taiwan. They haven't gone to mainland China yet. I don't know why uh, perhaps Taiwan's uh, taxation and uh, regulations and uh, competition rules, perhaps, or um, they just aren't ready for China. They're just they just want to you know when they do China, maybe they want to go in there with fifty locations within a year and really nail it down. I don't know what the reaction, what the timing is. Maybe it's happening as we speak, but according to this list, which is now complete, uh, China wasn't on the list. We had a few other guesses. Portugal came in. Uh, Thomas Henry, what? No, Tokyo? Uh, I think they might be in Tokyo because there are 26 in Japan. I'm sure Tokyo locations are in there, but uh, the list is complete. Uh, USA, Canada, Mexico, UK, Japan, Taiwan, South Korea, Australia, Spain, France, and Iceland. Very interesting. That is our first one. Well done, you guys. Um, that went pretty quick. The second one I'll give you is my big one that I have today. Uh, there are uh, 19 uh, actual answers, but I've got room for 20, um, and I'll tell you why in a minute. Uh, again, we're talking about countries, uh, so not not Tokyo, <laughs> not Bakersfield. Uh, Stephen Bean, how about the ingredients of a Costco hot dog? I don't think we want to go there. I don't think we want to know that. Uh, 
the question here in this case is tell me the countries where you can find a dairy queen where in the world are there dairy queens uh operating in this country uh, let me know and we'll see what the what the reaction is here um this list surprised me uh as to who is on and who is not on this list there's only 19 countries they have a dairy queen in only 19 countries you'd have think there would be 75 or something but uh paul wilgus is coming in with the united states right off the get-go and of course the usa is uh, definitely on the list steamy bean is thinking about singapore to sort of start off in left field and uh singapore had dairy queens until 2016 they closed them up and i'm curious as to why why is there no dairy queen anymore in singapore i thought that was an interesting uh, thing to notice nina frank had the us debbie emmanuel had the usa paul wilgus came in with canada canada definitely we've got uh, dairy queens here for sure have all my life that i can remember there have been dairy queens uh steaming bean canada betsy lane canada um D diane sanders japan i'm looking at my list and uh i do not see japan uh for dairy queens which surprises me uh, dramatically tremendously uh betsy lane think in england let's go with the united kingdom for that <coughs> excuse me no dairy queens in the uk uh showing uh thomas henry any shop at uh, bj's we have two and two costco any shop at bj's uh we have two and two costcos uh, thomas henry is asking uh, bj's uh two j uh, don't know what you mean, my friend, Tom. Steaming Bean, UK, no, Paul Wilgus, Mexico. What about Mexico? Um, what is the situation? Yeah, there are DK, DQs in Mexico. Uh, Diane Sanders, France. She's putting in for France. And uh, nope, no Dairy Queens in France. The Steaming Bean, Taiwan. What about Taiwan? um no i'm not showing any in taiwan according to this list uh uk we've done a uh, is here hi Katya. uh steaming bean mexico we did uh, diane sanders what about spain have we got any dairy queens in espana and the answer is no no dairy queens in spain again this is shocking me too debbie australia debbie manuel is wondering about australia and uh no no dairy queens in australia either again i was so shocked at that uh let's see steaming bean is thinking about uh, germany um let me find that there we are he's thinking about germany on the list let me take a look and see no i have no german dairy queens either uh paul wilgus brazil what about brazil big population uh you think there would be ice cream soft ice cream eaters in brazil dairy queen is not operating in brazil uh, costa rica from betsy lane or costa rico uh let's take a look yeah number 18 on the list there is uh there are dairy queens in costa rica um let's see here uh, steamy bean the vatican uh, he's always going with the vatican uh portugal diane sanders what about portugal um portugal not either spain or portugal neither uae united arab emirates for a dairy queen nope i'm shocked at that myself brazil not there portugal not there south korea jim thomas wondering about south korea and uh, the answer is no again a shocker to me uh spain no russia steaming bean what about russia are there dairy queens in russia and the answer is no, not in Russia, not in Brazil, Diane. Panama, Paul Wilgus, thinking about Panama. Yep, there are Dairy Queens in Panama. Uh, not big in Europe, Nina Frank is saying here. Uh, Steaming Bean is going after Kuwait. And I'm looking for Kuwait. No, I don't have a uh, location in Kuwait. There are locations in the Mideast. Uh, but and I would have thought Kuwait would be a slam dunk uh, with all the Western influences there. None. Uh, steam and bean, Saudi Arabia. Yes, that is a Mid East country with Dairy Queens. Saudi Arabia. There are others. Uh, we'll see if you come up with them, folks. Uh, Iraq. What about Iraq? Diane Sanders.
thinking about Iraq, I'm not sure if I'd want to operate a DQ in Iraq, being an American a brand, without being behind a fortified area. <laughs> no, there are no Iraqi DQs. Uh, steaming bean, Lebanon? Question? Lebanon? Lebanon. Pretty unstable there. I wouldn't be there either. Nope, there is no uh, no DQ in Lebanon. Uh, Bahamas. Katia Simonville, wondering about the Bahamas. Uh, yeah, they operate in the Bahamas. Well done. Uh, good guess. I uh, uh, hope you're not using uh, no cheating on on uh, on uh, Google. Just for off the top of your heads, folks. Bahrain, steaming bean. Yeah, Bahrain is definitely in the list here. I've got Bahrain there. Very well done. Iran, Iran. I don't think so. No, Iran has no no Dairy Queens. A little unstable for American businesses to run franchises there. I think. Paul Wilgus, what about Israel? Uh, that's a friendly place to America. Uh, and it is a friendly place to American businesses, but there are no Dairy Queens in Iran. In Israel, sorry, in Israel. Uh, or Iran, either, neither. Bermuda, steaming bean, Bermuda. Bermuda is part of the United Kingdom. Uh, that's a territory. So if there were uh, Dairy Queens in Cayman Islands, in uh, Bermuda, they would all be protected under the same. The British Virgin Islands would be UK protected. Uh, and yet I have no UK. I don't have UK at all. So they're not in any of these uh, protectorates that I can see here. I'm just going to triple check my list. Yeah, they don't have a single DQ in any British protectorate area at all. Uh, Cayman Islands just been guessed. Barbados has just been guessed. Uh, Barbados is its own country, um, part of the Commonwealth, of course, but uh, they don't have Dairy Queens in Barbados. Steaming Bean is wondering about Egypt. What about Egypt? Is there any brave soul operating? Yeah, there are e DQs in Egypt. Um, kind of, you know, kind of, I'd be, I wouldn't want to be the franchise owner in Egypt, I don't think. Uh, I'm not brave enough for that. Uh, Bermuda only has one U.S. franchise. Interesting. Nina Frank, Hong Kong. She's thinking about Hong Kong itself proper. No, Hong Kong as its own territory does not have a DQ, according to my list. Uh, I am looking for Mideast locations still. Asia countries, yes, I'm looking for Asia. I'm looking for South, I'm looking for North America other than the US and Canada and or Mexico. Uh, I'm looking for, uh, those are the regions I am looking for. I'm, uh, I'm looking for North America, Asia, uh, Mideast, those are the regions they are operating in and we haven't got guesses yet. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, Countries, 10 countries left to guess. Uh, Nina Frank is thinking, how about Alaska? That, that's a country unto itself, isn't it? Kind of like, you know, uh, you like Puerto Rico? That's, an, that's another country by itself, isn't it? Not going to work. Uh, <laughs> Guatemala, yep, Guatemala's on there. Well done. Got another one off of there. Um, I think I have an African country too, uh, which I'm surprised to see on this list. These are eclectic countries. So far, the guesses that are correct are Panama, the USA, Guatemala, Saudi Arabia, Bahrain, Canada, the Bahamas, Egypt, Costa Rica, Mexico, and Singapore was guessed, even though they closed two years ago, all Singaporean Dairy Queens. Uh, Guatemala, France. Jim Thomas is wondering about France. I think we had France guessed already, and no good. Uh, we don't need. European countries, actually. We're looking for uh, Africa, uh, the Mideast, Asia, uh, and I think that's it. Um, and, uh, yeah, one North American country left to go for. One North American country. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, a country very close to Bahrain, very close to Kuwait. Uh, very close to Saudi Arabia and the UAE, uh, the country I'm looking for in the Mideast for sure. And I'm just keeping an eye here on my guesses coming in. Uh, South Africa is not on the list. No. Uh, again, uh, why can't you sell Dairy Queen in South Africa? I don't get it. Uh, South, uh, Dairy Queen is owned by the uh, Berkshire Hathaway Group. Uh, so um, I'm not sure what their mentality is behind their uh, locations. 
Uh, Mexico, we've had guest, and um, uh, Mexico uh, is on the list, has been guest. Uh, Oman, Stealing Bean. Um, let me see on this list one more time. Yeah, Oman is definitely on the list. Not a heavily populated uh, Mideast country, and yet there they are. Um, I've got another one in the Mideast in that same neighborhood, if you can pick it up. Uh, Betsy Lane, it, it, it's a Caribbean island. Uh, is it a Caribbean island, the the, um, the one? Yes, I'm looking for a Caribbean island nation for one of them in North America. Yes. Uh, see if you guys can pick this one off. I'm looking for um, uh, Asia um, on the mainland of Asia and also Asian and island country in Asia as well. Um, Let's see if you come up with those. Here we go with some more guesses coming in here. Bolivia, Jordan, St. Lucia, or Trinidad. Uh, Trinidad is one of them. Uh, Trinidad, Tobago is the island nation of North America I'm looking for. Um, what is this coming in here? Jamaica just came in. No, not that's another country. Why aren't there Dairy Queens in Jamaica? There are no in, none in Jamaica at all. Uh, Taiwan is a guess, and I think I've already had this guess. Uh, and then Panama is another guess. We've already had a guess, and it was. It is a country. Uh, we've already got Panama. Um, I'm looking for um, uh, an uh, Asian country, island nation. There's two of them I'm looking for, at least. Um, and one of them is very American. Uh, very American. Uh, Philippines. Here's Kathy. You got it. Philippines is in the uh, uh, Asia. Uh, that's one of the island nations I'm looking for. There's another Asian country, uh, an island nation I'm looking for. Um, and I'm looking for a huge Asian country that is not an island nation. Here comes uh, the Philippines, which we just did. St. Martin for a North American guess. Uh, I think, uh, let me see if I'm done with North America now. Uh, uh, yeah, I'm done with North America. No more North American guesses needed. I'm looking for Africa. I'm looking for Asia. I'm looking for one, two, three, uh, four Asian countries plus a Mideast country at least. Uh, Australia. Nope, not on the list. No Dairy Queens in Australia. Go figure. Uh, you'd think there'd be Austra Australian Dairy Queens, uh, but nope, there aren't any. Might be There might just be all kinds of copyright issues. I, I don't know why they don't have them there. After all these decades being in business, Dairy Queen is a big entity. They're not in countries you would think of uh, like I would, uh, th that would be naturals. Uh, Mongolia, no, Canada, we did. We got Canada. Um, uh, don't need any North American countries at all. I'm looking for Asia and a Mideast country. Um, the the Mideast country I'm looking for is very small. It's kind of a small, like Kuwait is small, like Bahrain is small. I'm looking for a Mideast country that small in the Strait of Hormuz. Is where I'm looking. The USA we have Turkey. Nope, no Turkey needed. Sorry, no Turkey on the list. Uh, Asia. I'm looking for a country with uh, 700 million people. I'm looking for another country with at least 50 million people. Uh, not Japan. Um, uh, let's see. I'm looking for a country with the most people in the world uh, that hasn't been guessed yet. Um, and uh, I'm looking for a country that was involved in the Vietnam War, but not Vietnam. <laughs> uh, and then we're just about through it. Uh, let's see what we've got coming here. Um, uh, Philippines, St. Martin, Australia, Turkey. Here's China. There's China. Thank you. I need a China. I need another country with 700 million people in Asia. Uh, another country with 50-odd million in Asia, uh, at least. And um, a country right next to Vietnam, if not, might be neighbors. Um, uh, and uh, we'll pretty well have this list done. We're down to the last four or five now. As Indonesia just came in. Uh, thank you. That is one of, that's the 700 million people right there. Qatar. Uh, yes, thank you very much. Qatar is the other Mideast country. Uh, I am just about done here. Laos and one other country. It wasn't Laos I was looking for, but the country next to Laos that was involved in the Vietnam War. Uh, Thailand is being guessed. Uh, yes, Thailand is here. We've got it. Uh, thank you for Thailand, by the way, Nina. That's well done. 
Uh, we are now down to uh, two countries. The country next to Laos and Cambodia. Uh, I just said it. It's Cambodia. Sorry. Cambodia is the country I'm looking for. I'm, I'm thinking Vietnam, but I said Cambodia out loud. There's only one country left. It's in Africa. It starts with the letter B. A country with the letter B in Africa run by, I think, a monarch. I think. Uh, I sure hope I'm right on this. Uh, the countries we got so far, uh, concluding this list, Oman, the Philippines, Panama, USA, Cambodia, Guatemala, Indonesia, China, Qatar, Saudi Arabia, Bahrain, Canada, Bahamas, Thailand, Egypt, Trinidad, Tobago, Costa Rica, Mexico, and Singapore, which closed in 2016. There's one country left, starting with the letter B, located in Africa. Uh, Bahrain is in the Mideast, which we've already got. I believe we did, yes. I'm looking for one country in Africa. starts with a B. It's called Brunei, the country of Brunei. I cannot make out, can't make heads or tails of the Dairy Queen Corporation. Why do you have a location or more in Brunei, in Oman, uh, Cambodia? Um, uh, let's see, uh, countries like um, um, Costa Rica, small but nice place. Uh, Singapore, you did and you don't now. Why don't you have date locations in France? How come none in the United Kingdom? What's wrong with Germany? Uh, these uh, Spain and Portugal, I mean, hot. Uh, Got to be ice cream loving. Maybe there are rules with regard to the kind of product you can sell uh, from, from a dairy perspective. Uh, maybe that's what's keeping Dairy Queen out. I just don't know. Uh, some of these are very interesting. Paul saying, Kathy Butler, the Sultan of Brunei loves blizzards, laughing out loud. Uh, Paul Wilkos, yeah, I think so. I, Paul Wilkos thinks the same thing. It's got to be it. I don't get it. Uh, um, I know that Dairy Queen back in the, I'm going to say it's the 80s, could have been earlier. They switched, uh, Steaming Bean, you're saying it right there. They switched from being true dairy ice cream to what's called ice milk. And that's a cheaper form of product. Uh, you can add additives to it. You can add cornstarch and other ingredients to, to give you the feel of taste of ice cream, but it isn't ice cream. And it may have been one of those corporate decisions um, to uh, uh, change the, the, the formula of the main ingredient of Dairy Queen's ice cream to an ice milk version. And it's easier to operate thousands of locations with the fake product rather than the real product and from a pricing point of view with regard to refrigeration um do you have to keep dairy queen product refrigerated as intently as say ice milk has to be i i, I can't answer the question off the top of my head i'm only speculating that dairy queen went with a lower quality product for the masses, so I'll go up here, uh, rather than the way they were before. And maybe certain countries just won't let them in. Switzerland won't let them in. Austria, uh, maybe other countries in Europe won't let them sell their product and call it what they want to call it. I, I don't know. I don't, I can't put my finger on, but that's the one reason maybe why this list is so eclectic. It's so odd. I get, you know, we, we in Canada and the United States, they can feed us anything because we'll eat it. <laughs> we're just, we're either that gullible or that cheap, or we're just not, we just don't care. Um, you know, in, in the United States and Canada, we can buy real ice cream from grocery stores. We can buy the Dairy Queen version, the McDonald's version, the, the Burger King version of ice cream. Uh, you know, there's the Ben and Jerry's, there's the uh, the Hagen Dosses of the world. Uh, you know, we we eat anything, and in the United States and Canada, we're allowed to eat anything, and um, it's just cheaper. As Kathy's saying, it's way cheaper to serve ice milk. McDonald's said the same in the '80s. There's probably the reaction and the reason for it. It's all about the money, um, and as long as the customer buys it uh, as a price sensitive product, they'll sell it, and there you have it. Baskins, there's, there you go. Baskins and Robins. Thank you, Steamer. Yeah, there's another, you know, uh, another reason why some countries, some brands operate certain ways. Other brands sell product another way. 
And we, the consumer, can choose where we want to go to eat what we want to eat. But if you're overseas looking for a DQ treat, you might not find it as easily as you think you're going to find it, like you're as easily to find McDonald's and its treat. What I don't know for sure is in Germany, what can you buy at a McDonald's for ice cream versus what you can buy at a McDonald's in the United States, if at all? There's the, the difference, too. Anyway, that's what I'm mentioning. Steamy bean ice cream on a ship is never great. <laughs> there you go. I noticed on a steamer, I noticed they have gelato on the cruise ships. And I'm sure that's a higher quality product than ice milk, uh, but you're paying for it rather than the free up, free ice cream upstairs on the deck where they get the soft serve. Sometimes they let you operate the soft serve machine to your heart's content. Other times they don't. Uh, the buffet, sometimes they let you do it. Sometimes they don't. So yeah, there you go. I know that um, I think it was Holland America had an ice cream station in the buffet operating at lunch and dinner time, and they had the employee behind the ice cream stand, and it was all big five-gallon buckets of ice cream. Uh, it was all the real stuff, the good stuff, uh, but only they could touch it. You couldn't touch it. So, yeah, there you go. Nina Frank, Sweden have only genuine ice cream. My town has this little place famous for their soft ice cream. People drive miles to get it. Kathy Butler, I saw Oceana ad has uh, Oceana has in their ads that they are the number one rated in dining because they spend more on food ingredients than any other cruise line. Ingredients really matter. And Kathy, that is Norwegian Cruise Lines. Norwegian owns Oceana. Isn't that something? And Norwegian last quarter back last year, they were bragging in their annual financial report that they had more passengers on all of their cruise lines combined than the year before, and they spent less on food. And yet, Oceana talks about the quality of their food. I found that interesting. Now, I do know, uh, I did read something about Oceana's uh, uh, food quality is the best. In the Norwegian line, of, of the Norwegian Cruise Lines lines, Oceana has the top grade product. Very interesting stuff. Steaming Bean, they had Cake Boss on NCL. There you go. Steaming Bean, Sweden may have better ice cream, but Canada has better hockey. Okay, but I like to like to watch hockey eating ice cream. So I kind of like the ice cream to be, you know. <laughs> oh, man, here we go. All right, one more trivia game to go are you ready and then we're done for the day here's the last category this again is um this again is cities and there's one city that debbie you can go with uh, you're going to get this one right the largest subway systems in the world i may have asked you before about the busiest but today i'm asking you for the largest cities subway systems on the planet who's got the most miles uh, for subway systems. And let's find out which cities you come up with. The steam and bean is saying, go Jets, go. He's thinking Winnipeg with its massive subway system. There is no subway system in Winnipeg, <laughs> but go Jets anyway. Uh, Lena Frank is thinking London, England. And uh, London is the number two largest subway system on the planet. And it is a big one. Paul Wilgus is going for New York City. And New York City is number three on the list. Uh, Steaming Bean is thinking about Beijing, and Beijing is number eight and climbing. Uh, there are ten, The top ten is what I'm looking for. Nina has New York. Uh, Kathy Butler's got Tokyo in there. Tokyo is correct. Uh, that is the tenth largest, and it's a busy one. We know that. London from Paul Wilgus. Berlin from Kathy Butler. Correct. Berl uh, Berlin is on the list at number four. The fourth largest subway system on the planet in Berlin. I've ridden it. It is incredible. Um, clean, uh, efficient, modern, works very well. Uh, Paris, Peter Heckema. Uh, Peter Heckema, yeah, number nine system in the world. I've been on that one too. Uh, very well done. Steaming Bean got Paris. Paul Wilgus is thinking about Toronto. They're big, but they're not top 10 in the world big. No. We've got London, New York City, Berlin. We got Beijing, Paris, and Tokyo. Six correct, four left to go. Uh, Toronto came in. Moscow from the steaming bean. Uh, that is the sixth largest system in the world. Yes, sir. And one of the oldest, uh, definitely, and heavily ridden, obviously. 
Alexander Plutz, uh, Steam and Bean, yeah, Alexander Plutz, and the uh, main, uh, the main Hofbound Hof, uh, the main uh, train station in Berlin. They got the rail line, the regional rail line, and the U-Bahn and the S-Bahn as well, all in one place. And outside of the uh, the huge railway station in Berlin, the tram cars and the buses. Wow, it's all there in one place. Incredible, breathtaking. It's a tourist site in its own right, the main railway station in Berlin. It's, you, know, you won't believe it once you're in there. It is stunning. Chicago, Kathy Butler is thinking about Chicago. No, they're not in the top 10. Steam and Bean is wondering about Rio. No, Rio is not a top 10 in size. Steam and Bean, uh, yeah, yeah, bitter. Yeah, yeah, bitter. Yeah, yeah, bitter. Bitter, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, bitter. But Nina Frank, uh, Bonhoeff Zoo. Uh, the, the, well, Berlin Zoo is incredible too. Yeah, it is incredible. Debbie Manuel, Tokyo. Thank you, Debbie. I knew you are coming. We, we already have it. But I'm giving it to you. You're right. <laughs> Way to go, Debbie. Um, let's see. I still need the number one system, the number five, and the number seven. Uh, I have ridden the second largest, the third largest, the fourth largest, personally. And I've ridden the ninth largest in the world, uh, Tokyo, the, the systems. That would be Paris as well. I've been on the Berlin. I've been on the New York and the London uh, subway systems. Absolutely incredible, all of them. They're amazing. Um, Steaming Bean, Berlin rocks. It does, my friend. It does. Debbie Manuel, dang, internet trouble today. And Kathy Butler is asking about Osaka. Does Osaka Japan rank? They're not in the top 10, but they're big. Uh, I need one city uh, is an Asian city. Uh, the number five city is an Asian city. The number seven city is in Europe. So those are the three left. To guess, two Asia, one European city left to go. <clears throat> and we got this list nailed down. Um, yeah, Paris was rather interesting. Uh, I rather enjoyed Paris' system. I found it a bit of a pain, though, because my wife and I, uh, Jen and I, went through Paris with our suitcases, and that wasn't fun. Stairs. Stairs. Oh, we didn't like that. Uh, showing its age. Um, what do we got? Steaming bean. Asparagus season in Germany was a month ago. Asparagus season is here right now in Creston, and it just got freshly picked, and it is glorious again. Kathy Butler, Shanghai, number one system in the world for size. The biggest subway system in the world, Shanghai. A very good. Washington, D.C. from Thomas Henry. I personally thought Washington would be on the top 10 list, but it's not in size. It's a popular, heavily used system, but not in size. I've been on the Washington system. Very good. Very good. Uh, so, RD Con. Yeah, way to go, RD. You nailed it. Uh, so, it's the number five largest system in the world. We got one left. It's a European city. Uh, take your guesses. Um, Jim Thomas, me too, kiddo. Um, Thomas Henry, I love the rubber tire on the Paris, Paris subway uh, in 1983. I love the rubber tire on the Paris subway in 1983. Uh, Thomas, you're going to give me some detail on that. Was that an incident? Um, I don't know. Um, any of you folks uh, have a guess as to what subway system in the world is the seventh largest on the planet in a European city? We've already got London. We already have Berlin. We've got Moscow. We've got Paris. We have one more city to go for. Barcelona, Steamer, you're close. You got the right country, just got the wrong city. Uh, and I'm sure Barcelona is good size. Uh, Mad Madroid, <laughs> Madrid, yeah, it's Madrid, Spain, number seven overall. I haven't been on that one yet. Uh, this we got the ten largest. It is Shanghai, London, New York, Berlin, Seoul, Moscow, Madrid, Beijing, Paris, Tokyo. Uh, absolutely, Prague, steaming bean. Uh, good guess too, but not in the top ten. We got them. You did all the. Uh, you did all the. Uh, um, uh, subway systems and uh, we've done our trivia for today well done everybody not bad at all uh, not a big crowd today but a loyal dedicated crowd I got 20 thumbs ups today thank you everybody for that I appreciate those very much um, I'm going to be off tomorrow uh, scheming some more videos I'll be on on Monday 5 o'clock eastern time back to the regular program programming and schedule 
And let's see if we can attract 63 more subscribers to the channel this week and go for 2,000 subs. That will be awesome. Uh, right now, it is at 1,937 subscribers. I want to thank you guys very much for joining me today. Uh, have yourselves a great weekend. Uh, I can tell on my watch time minutes, uh, the last couple days, there's my watch time. And here's today's show. Look at all that watch time coming in there on the live stream. That's how it works every time. Thank you for joining me today. I hope you enjoyed yourselves. I want to thank you uh, for your continued following of my channel. Thanks for your contributions to my cause. Thank you for uh, visiting my uh, store uh, and for the, uh, the support on Patreon and on PayPal. Thank you, each and every one of you. Have a great weekend. Uh, we'll see you guys on Monday. I'll tell Jen happy Mother's Day. That is tomorrow. I will let her know. Great show as always, Bruce. Thank you from RD Con. Thank you, Artie. Thanks, Paul Steamer. Thank you for coming by again. To Jim, Thomas, Thomas Henry, thank you. Kathy, Debbie, Nina, thank you again for popping by. Love it, you guys. Uh, uh, thanks for those of you who are joining on cruise ships and from big SRVs on the road. Uh, loving it. And uh, have yourselves a good one. We'll see you on Monday, 5 o'clock Eastern time. Take care, everybody, and we'll see you soon. Goodbye for now.